Good afternoon, TCGA. Uh, my name is Scott Carter. I'm going to be talking today about a lot of work that I did uh, for my PhD thesis, but a lot of it is very relevant to TCGA. Uh, so basically, it's going to have three different parts. I'm going to talk briefly about a method, a computational method that we developed to infer tumor purity, uh, ploidy, and absolute allelic copy numbers directly from allelic copy number data, so either SNP array or sequencing. And then I'm going to talk about some various applications of that, both to sort of design uh, genomic experiments and to actually interpret and hopefully learn some new biology. So one of the sort of caveats to a big characterization effort like the TCGA is that we're actually always uh, analyzing data generated from a population of heterogeneous cells rather than sort of individual tumor nuclei. So you can see on my slide, you can think of a, a big tumor as having two, at least two big populations, those of tumor cells and those of contaminating normal cells. Now the normal cells typically we think of as having a diploid genome, uh, whereas the tumor cells can have almost an arbitrarily complex seeming genome uh, with very aberrant carrier type and very altered ploidy. So these two attributes dramatically affect the kinds of copy data signal that you derive when you mash these things up and either run out the resulting DNA on a SNP array or do um, sequencing on those things. So we, we were motivated to develop a method that could actually sort of deconvolve at least these two populations and give you uh, integral integer estimates of allelic copy numbers uh, fixed in the cancer clone, as well as to understand if the tumor ploidy and the, uh, the purity of the tumor itself. So this is a slide sort of giving an overview of the inference methodology. So in the top left, you can see the sort of uh, collapsed estimates from all the individual heterozygous markers in a given individual to give you what we call homolog-specific copy ratio, or essentially allelic copy ratio that's smoothed across the genome. So you can see we infer two distinct copy ratio values for every locus in the genome, uh, representing each of the two homologous chromosomes. But the, the challenge is sort of to take this as its input into um, and to understand what the mapping is of these sort of uh, discrete seeming levels in the data are to actual uh, integer allelic copy numbers. So you can see on the bottom, um, there are sort of three distinct uh, solutions that, that are essentially mappings of those peaks you see in the data to uh, integer uh, allelic copy estimates. So on the top right of the slide, you can see that each of those three solutions corresponds to a different combination of tumor purity and ploidy. Uh, so the question is to decide which of these three possibilities is, is the correct one. Uh, and in general, unfortunately, it's sort of impossible to, to solve this problem uh, just by itself without it bringing in some external data, because you can see sort of the blue and the green solution fit the data equally well. So to break the tie, or ties like this, we developed uh, what we call karyotype models, which are sort of bootstrapped up from thousands of tumor samples that we um, analyzed and also have some information coming from cytological data, which are to say, uh, they're, they're essentially mixture models of what are recurrent cancer karyotypes, and they're specific to the tumor type you're analyzing to be more sensitive, although that's not really necessary. So using these karyotype models, you can often break the score and get a nice prediction about what the actual true solution is without having to resort to cytological or sort of facts-based techniques in order to understand the true purity value, uh, ploidy value as well. And I get one more caveat of this is that almost no tumor I've analyzed is truly clonal, um, and even in terms of copy number. So you can see here, uh, if you look at the black arrows, there does seem to appear here a uh, subclonal gain of chromosome 2, which is explicitly modeled by our method as subclonal. And the, the trick here is not to overfit these subclonal copy alterations by proposing a much more complex karyotype than is truly warranted. So to validate this, uh, we've done several experiments. Uh, so the purity validation is, is derived by mixing t uh, cancer and normal cell lines, and then uh, running them out on SNP arrays and getting back the, the more or less correct mixing fraction. The ploidy analysis was done actually on uh, some of the TCGA ovarian cancer primaries, where we actually uh, went and did uh, facts on them to estimate ploidy. And you can see it correlates quite well with our estimates, although there are a few samples that seem to have been misclassified. So, actually, uh, before I move on, I just want to say we've been sort of using this method at the Broad since, or for a couple years, to select only the highest purity samples for whole genome sequencing efforts to ensure that we have uh, good power in order to detect uh, alterations in all those expensive experiments. <clears throat> 
Um, so, right, so that leads into my next point, which is sort of about how purity and polity affect uh, uh, sequencing types of experiments. So there's a strong relationship between um, purity and copy number. I think Gaddy's talked about this a lot, where basically the higher copy number, local copy number you are, the deeper you need to sequence to detect a mutation at one copy per cell in that sample. Similarly, it seems intuitive, but um, the lower the, the purity of the sample is, the deeper you need to sequence in order to adequately find mutations. And th those relationships are illustrated on this slide. Perhaps most interesting here is uh, if you look on the, the far right here, so if you want to be able to detect subclonal events, um, say at 20% cell fraction, um, then you need to sequence fairly deep. But on the other hand, these numbers that you're seeing down there are actually uh, pretty readily attained with a lot of our whole exome experiments that we're doing uh, currently. So now I'm going to talk about actually rescaling these estimates of, of allelic fraction that people always talk about into L estimates of what we call multiplicity, which is to say an estimate of the number of mutant alleles per cancer cell. So this is uh, data from the TCGA uh, ovarian cancer, whole exome sequencing on Illumina. And you can see on the left, we just combined all like 30,000 mutations that we detected. And the allelic fraction distribution doesn't seem to have a lot of structure in it. It's kind of a smear. Uh, that's because there are a lot of copy number alterations in this tumor type, and more importantly, perhaps, because there are very differ different purities, which totally obscure these allele fractions. On the other hand, using absolute, you now know what the integer allelic copy numbers are for every position in the genome, and you know the tumor purity. So with, with that and the allelic fraction, you can rescale these raw allelic fractions into what we call multiplicity estimates, which you're seeing on the bottom right of this plot. And nicely, there's a nice peak that you see at 1.0, which is to say that the modal sort of point estimate is about you know, one copy of a mutant allele per cancer cell. Uh, for the clonal cases, but you also see an additional uh, peak in this distribution on the left, which is colored pink. So these, we, we surmise, are uh, actually subclonal uh, mutations in these, in these tumors. Uh, we think the distribution we're seeing here is mostly consistent with neutral evolution, so it's sort of unlike the earlier um, AML data we saw today uh, that had discrete subclones at, at sort of high uh, allele, uh, multiplicities or allelic fractions. Um, okay. So this plot, I think, was important for us to just prove to ourselves that these subclonal alterations are likely to be real. Um, so the idea is that um, if, if these subclonal alterations were germline contaminants or if they were machine noise, they would have a different fingerprint in the sense of a different um, uh, a mutant allele spectrum, right? So the, the frequency of C to T transversions or C to A, et cetera, would be very different. But in fact, as you can see on the bottom left, they're very similar, um, which gave us some confidence there. In contrast, if you look at the, uh, the plot comparing the mutant allele spectrum uh, of tumor to germline SNPs, it looks very different. So this is sort of like a fingerprinting, and it shows that the subclonal and clonal mutations in ovarian cancer have the same fingerprint. <clears throat> so the next thing we did was to try to actually see if we could use this multiplicity estimate um, in order to learn something about, uh, to classify what, what these mutated genes might be. So we took these 15 genes that we discussed in the ovarian paper and tried to understand which were frequently homozygous, which is to say there were zero copies of the wild type allele remaining in the, uh, the cancer clone. So as you can see, a lot of the, the top genes, the top tumor suppressors like P53 and NF1 and BRCA2 have a, a large proportion of their mutations uh, rendering that gene homozygous. So it's like there, there are no wild type copies left. Whereas a lot of the oncogenes do not have this property. <clears throat> In addition, we were able to see that um, the, the P53 locus was often present at two or more copies per cancer cell in ovarian cancer. Um, so 60% of the mutations in P53 were actually were amplified in this regard. Um, and this led us to believe that actually P53 is likely to be a very early uh, event in these cells since very, very few other genes uh, in the genome have this kind of recurrent fraction of amplified mutant alleles. So now I'm going to talk about uh, the last thing is just inferring uh, genome doublings in human cancer development from these absolute allelic copy number estimates. So I think genome doubling had been really widely speculated about uh, for a long time, and if you look at cytological data, like on the top right here, there's clearly a bimodal distribution of ploidy by, say, fax or uh, spectral carry typing. Um, so it stands to reason that a lot of these passage through a tetraploid intermediate, for example. 
Um, on the bottom right, I'm showing the ploidy estimate, the distribution of ploidy estimates we got for various different tumor types using absolute, and we can see that it recapitulates qualitatively the sort of bimodal ploidy distribution. But the additional information that you get from absolute allelic copy number data allows you to actually look at an individual tumor sample and make a, a more precise determination of whether or not it went through a genome doubling. So you can see here, I'm, I'm visualizing both the low copy homologs on the left and the high copy, copy homologs on the right for the same samples. Uh, the samples are sorted by ploidy uh, uh, from top to bottom. So high ploidy on the top, low ploidy on the bottom. You can see here this, this distribution uh, recapitulates the sort of bimodal ploidy distribution that you saw in all these cancers earlier. And, but uh, I think more interestingly is that right at the inflection point of the ploidy distribution, you see a transition from low, low homolog copy numbers of zero and one to low homolog copies of zero and two. And similar on, on the uh, right side, you go from sort of one and two to two and four. So this is even more precise evidence of the genome doubling, and we sort of formalized this with a statistical simulation, sort of giving p-values to this, but it, it's, I think it's actually pretty obvious when you look at the allelic copy data. <clears throat> so now we can actually take, you know, a large set of 3,000 copy profiles that we've analyzed with this method and try to characterize how common genome doublings are across human cancer. Uh, and you can see it, it on the top right, it, it actually varies. Um, from different cancers, but for example, the ovarian cancer data on TCGA, about 60% of the samples went through at least one genome doubling event during their evolution, whereas things like ALL and MPD uh, don't usually have genome doublings, and the GBM samples from TCGA had a, a small proportion, maybe 20% that did genome double. On the bottom right, I hope you can appreciate that it's not as simple as sort of thresholding by ploidy, right? You sort of, you really want to use the, the allelic copy number data and make thresholds in that space rather than just in the total ploidy, because after genome doubling, you can see that the, the peak of the genome doubled samples is about 3N, uh, which means that there are, you know, probably gains that happen, or rather losses that, that occur uh, prior to genome doubling, and I think even more losses that occur uh, following that genome doubling event. <clears throat> so it's just speaking to that idea of which happens first, um, if you look at the patterns of LOH in ovarian cancer, uh, by chromosome arm, you see that actually for a given arm, the frequency of LOH uh, in doubled samples and in non-doubled samples is nearly identical, which I think is reasonably good evidence that um, these aneuploidies, chromosome armor level aneuploidies tend to occur early on in ovarian cancer, and specifically these LOH events. And this is, uh, but also amplification events also as seen on the bottom here. Um, and this is, this is actually a general feature of many human cancers that show this pattern. <clears throat> Uh, right, so these, these are many different human cancers that we analyzed that show this, pa this pattern. So in general, genome doubled tumors have many more somatic copy number alterations. Um, this is sort of showing the sort of log-log plot of the uh, somatic copy number length versus their, their frequency, and you can see the straight line sort of fitting this power, power uh, law model. So interestingly, the, the slope of the lines for each of the genome doubled groups is, is very similar, suggesting that um, somewhat similar mechanisms govern these things, but like you have more DNA perhaps so that the rate of, uh, the rate of um, actually generating genome alterations is higher. <clears throat> so in ovarian cancer, um, we were able to show that the number of mutations, uh, so for example, clonal heterozygous mutations on the top uh, increases as a function of genome doubling. On the other hand, um, in the same bar plot, if you divide by ploidy, that effect totally goes away, which is to say that the sort of mutation rate per base is probably the same across these samples, and what you're seeing is just the effect of more DNA at risk to be mutated. On the other hand, uh, clonal homozygous mutations tend to decrease as a function of genome doubling, as you might expect. After you've doubled the genome, it actually becomes significantly harder to create a homozygous, either uh, copy alteration or mutation. And you can see on the bottom of uh, homozygous deletions in ovarian cancer, they, they tend to go down as a function of genome doublings. So interestingly, of the 15 uh, NF1 mutations that I, we, I saw in this particular uh, set of 214 ovarian cancers, 13 of them occurred in the non-genome doubled set, uh, in which case they were all homozygous. So that sort of suggests that you're getting specific selection just on the recessive inactivation of NF1 as expected for a tumor suppressor. But what's, what's even more interesting about this is that we didn't observe any amplified mutations in NF1 in the genome doubled samples, which means that it's not that uh, 
NF1 can happen early and then become uh, duplicated by genome doubling, as happens with p53. A sort of like NF1 mutation seems to commit you to the non-genome doubled uh, trajectory of evolution in ovarian cancer. And finally, just a few associations with the clinical data. Um, the, the patient age at diagnosis tended to increase um, as a function of genome doublings, which was significant. I'm not quite sure what that means, but it's sort of interesting, and it might have some interesting relations to uh, telomere biology. Um, there, and there is a, a small but significant association with time to recurrence uh, and genome doubling in ovarian cancer. So that's it. I'd like to thank um, Gaddy Getz and Matthew Meyerson and all my colleagues at the Broad and all of the uh, TCGA. Thanks very much. Thank you, Scott. Uh, other questions? Well, perhaps I'd like to start with a question. Well, I actually had two questions, but let me start with this one. I'm, I'm curious if you could comment on why do you see a power law between the, the number of these uh, yeah, events and uh, the length? I think there's a, there's a paper in press, I believe, currently. Uh, it's Foldenberg et al. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not going to get the name wrong, but I think it's really, I think it's supposed to be related to the, the fractal globule three-dimensional structure of the human genome, which would predict sort of the, the contact length distribution would be power law distributed or closely. Hmm, power law interesting. Distributed. Okay, and also my, my other question was, uh, can you comment on, I didn't quite understand why is it that the mutant allele spectrum would be different if the samples were contaminated? Right, because in general, germline variation always vastly exceeds somatic mutation rates, right? So you'd be swamped with germline variants, and they have a very different mutation uh, spectrum. Okay. Thank you. Cheers. Okay. Thanks again. <laughs>